Thank you, wake up call. That's one of my one of my favorites. Good morning. Glad to see everybody here this morning. A little bit foggy outside. As I prayed with the the band this morning, I, I just prayed that uh, we would be able to bring the light, the sunshine that comes from Jesus Christ in here today, but I suspect we'll have plenty of it later on today, the way it sounds. It is good to, to see you here this morning. For those of you who are uh, guests with us today, uh, this summer I've been preaching a series on the life of King David from the books of First and Second Samuel. And over the past weeks, we've seen David, the, the shepherd boy, called and anointed by God to become the king of Israel. We've seen him become a mighty warrior and then actually become the king. We saw how God blessed him. God blessed David in, in just about everything he did and he became very successful. But a couple of weeks ago, we shared a, a scripture in which we were reminded that David certainly is human. Uh, we talked about the king falling from, from grace. He committed adultery with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. And uh, then in an attempt to, to cover up that sin, he arranged for Uriah's death thus leaving the door open for King David to, to marry Bathsheba and continue to, to cover up the sin. And that's where we begin today. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 26, and then reading into chapter 12 and verse 13. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. He brought it up and grew it up with, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, You are the man. You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house for you have despised me 
and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this very son. For you did it secretly. But I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. This is the word of God for the people of God. Have you ever been caught red-handed? Or perhaps you were caught, who took that picture of me? With your hand in the cookie jar. Literally. <laughs> in the home where I grew up, there was a rule. Probably somewhat like a rule that, was, that is in most of your homes, that you don't eat cookies or such things before a meal because it'll spoil your supper. Well, many of you were probably unaware of this, but that rule was created especially with me in mind. Because I can eat cookies anytime, morning, noon, or night even in the middle of the night. And certainly before a meal. And more than once as a child, I was caught with my hand in the, in the cookie jar before a meal. And if, if the truth were told, and the truth is sitting here, so she'll probably tell you, I've been caught more than once as an adult with my hand in the cookie jar before a meal. I suppose we think we can get away with it. So we reach for the cookie. Or we tell the lie. Or we spread the rumor. Or we cheat on the test. Or we take that item that really doesn't belong to us. We believe we can do things in secret, in the dark, when no one is watching. And because no one is watching, we think we'll get away with it. David must have believed that he was going to get away with adultery and, and murder. Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, is dead because of the orders that David gave. And so Bathsheba mourns for him, and then after the mourning period, David, King David, invites her to move into the palace with him and to become his wife, one of his wives. David thought he was going to get away with it, that he was going to be able to, to cover up his sin because nobody was watching, but he was wrong. Someone was watching. Now maybe no human saw firsthand what, what had happened, what David did, but God knew. God always knows. As the author of Hebrews puts it, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Everything is uncovered. And Jesus says in Luke 12, there's nothing covered up that will not be revealed. Hear that. Nothing hidden that will not be known. Accordingly, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light. And what you have whispered in the inner rooms shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. God speaks to the prophet Nathan and, 
and tells Nathan what David did. So Nathan pays David a little visit and, and tells him a parable about a rich man. A rich man who feels the need to feed someone who is passing through the area. Now this rich man, he has plenty of flocks and, and herds, but he is unwilling to take just one of the many from his flock or, or herd to butcher it so that he can feed this poor traveler. And so what does he do? But he, he takes from a poor man. He takes the only ewe lamb that this poor man has and has it butchered to feed instead. And after hearing the parable, the scripture says, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. In other words, David was furious. David was angry that this rich man would do such a thing. And of course, it's just a parable, but David was angry at the thought of it. And David says, that man deserves to die. And that's when Nathan says to David, you are the man. Mm. Mm. You are the man, David. You are the rich man who has everything, and yet you stole the poor man's wife. Well, the secret was no longer a secret. Somebody knew. So now what would David do? Well, David could have flat out denied it. David could have made all kinds of excuses to try to, to justify himself. David could have said, hey, I'm the king here. I make the rules. But that's not what David did. In verse 13, we have David's response. Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. No excuses. Simply, I'm guilty. I did it. I have sinned. David confesses his sin, and you've heard it said, but confession is good for the soul. And then note what Nathan tells David after David confesses. He says, the Lord has put away your sin. The Lord has put it away. Confessed sin is always forgiven. Confessed sin is always forgiven. 1 John 1.9 says that if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sin and will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The first step to having our relationship with God restored is to confess our sin. We need to admit that we, that we messed up. Ask any recovering alcoholic or any drug addict. Admitting that you have a problem is the first step toward recovery. And if we don't confess our sins, they begin to build up. And they build up like a pile of garbage. Sin that has not been confessed from our lives is like garbage in our spiritual lives. Think about it this way. When we're, when we're born, we start out with, with an empty garbage bag. But as we go through life, we begin to slowly fill that garbage bag up. Uh, a few little white lies here, 
uh, some gossip there, some jealousy, some bitterness. It all goes, goes into the bag and maybe even some excessive drinking or some drugs or some stealing. The list begins to grow and the garbage bag gets more and more full. The garbage bag gets heavier and heavier. And confession is like taking the garbage out. Confession is taking the garbage out. I used that illustration in a sermon in my first appointment. And the next week, a couple told me that when they were driving home from worship the previous Sunday, they asked the kids the question that they always asked them on the way home. What did you learn from Pastor Dean's sermon today? And their youngest son, who was about six years old at the time, said, take out the trash. Well, I say at least he was listening. <laughs> and he was right. He was right. We all need to take the trash out of our lives that is collected there. We need to confess the sin in our life. Whether that sin is, is being jealous of someone or having committed adultery. Because a sin in the eyes of God is a sin. And every sin, regardless of its size, needs to be confessed to God. Do you have any sin in, in your life? Do you have some garbage in your life that needs to be taken out? Maybe the garbage has been in your life for a while. That sin has been there. You know what happens to garbage when it's been there for a while, don't you? It begins to stink. It begins to smell bad. Maybe there's some sin in, in your life that's really starting to smell bad. Maybe it's time to take out the trash. In Psalm 51, the psalm that David wrote in response to Nathan confronting him, David says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. Blot out my transgressions. Blot out my transgressions. Forgive me of the sin in my life. After David had confessed his sin, he begged for God's forgiveness. And when we mess up, when you mess up, when I mess up, we need to confess it to God, to ask for God's forgiveness. Now that may not be an easy thing to do, to fess up, <laughs> as we sometimes say. But it's something we must do to admit our sin and, and our failure. To admit to each other. To confess to each other. And most of all, to, to admit and confess it to God. And remember again what the Bible says. If we do confess our sin, He is faithful. He is just. And He will forgive us for our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. David was forgiven for what he did. It's called grace. It's called grace. Grace is something that we don't deserve. But it's available to us because of what Jesus did on the cross. And the last song that 
that wake-up call led us in. Your grace is enough. It was the main line in that song. Your grace is enough for me. Now, it doesn't mean that sin is okay. Because we're forgiven doesn't mean God's saying it's okay to sin. What it means is that sin can be forgiven. Just like the words to the hymn, Amazing Grace. We're going to have these words in our last song here. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was lost, but now I'm forgiven. I once was blind, but now I see. I was blind, but I've been forgiven. I once was guilty, but now I'm forgiven. No matter how long ago you committed that sin, it's not too late. Today is not too late to confess that sin, to receive the forgiveness that God offers. But you've got to take the trash out today. Take it out. Because God is waiting to forgive you. Let us pray. God, we come before you guilty. We come before you with sin in our lives. But we thank you for Jesus Christ and for the grace that is enough, the grace that is ours, the grace that forgives us. God, help us to take the sin out of our lives, to confess it to you, and to receive the forgiveness that only you can offer. Through Jesus Christ we pray. <coughs> Amen.